So we now reached 252 million years ago and the largest extinction event on the planet. This is called the Great Dying and was the boundary between the Permian period and the Triassic. And it's when the trilobites died out. They'd ruled the uh, planet for 270 million years, uh, but this absolute catastrophe took out 96% of all the marine species and 70% of all the land-based species of whatever type. So it nearly wiped out all life on Earth. And there are several possible reasons for this. One is the impact of an, a large asteroid into the ocean. There's evidence of it. There's evidence of shocked quartz. There's evidence of fullerenes from a uh, uh, carbon from uh, soot with uh, extraterrestrial noble gases trapped in it and lots of iron nickel silicate grains that presumably originated from the impacting asteroid and in fact we've got multiple possible impact sites there are four listed here um, in Australia, Antarctica, Brazil and off the Falkland Islands all in the water all enormous you can see there the Wilkesland crater, 300 miles across. It's one of the largest craters uh, on Earth. And it's possible that all of these date to the same time and that this was a, a storm of impacts all coming in in very quick succession. But on the other side of the world over in Siberia, there was also a huge eruption of uh, flood basalt lava from this what's called the Siberian traps. Now this is possibly also where the earth might have been hit by a large asteroid or it's the diametrically opposite point on earth from where the asteroid hit we're not quite sure and there was evidence of huge amounts of damage to the ozone layer from ultraviolet light Masses of carbon dioxide went into the atmosphere because of all this of volcanic activity. Temperature went up, the oceans turned acid, and almost all of the oxygen disappeared, probably because the skies were covered in dust and uh, there was no sunlight getting through for photosynthesis. Now the astronomical connection here really is to think about the moon and the mare, the lunar seas, you can see them on this half moon image here. These are flood basalts on the moon. They're where enormous asteroids punctured the moon's crust and brought material to the surface. So maybe the same thing happened on Earth, creating these flood basalts that covered near continent sized areas with uh, molten rock. Uh, maybe the impactor was particularly large and punched right through uh, and brought material to the surface. This could explain why we see these flood basalts at, at round about the same time as all of these impact events. And maybe the argument about which came first is, um, well, not quite like arguing which came first, the chicken or the egg, because they both came at the same time. And in fact, we've got evidence of this sort of thing happening on the planet Mercury. There's the Caloris Basin shown as circular feature in the false color image at the bottom there on Mercury and diametrically opposite at the antipode, 180 degrees around on the opposite side of Mercury. There is cracked and chaotic terrain that shows that the enormous impact that created this uh, 1,500 kilometer wide crater, so a thousand mile diameter crater on Mercury. The impact shock waves went right through the planet and nearly burst out the far side. So it's, it's possible that the, uh, an impact on one side of the planet could cause lava to spew forth on the other. Now this is the Permian Great Dying about 251.5 million years ago. And uh, John Gribben, famous writer, had another explanation for all of this. He said, well, actually, around about 250 million years ago, he thought maybe the sun passed through one of the dense parts of the spiral arm of our galaxy. And maybe that could have led to a lot of dust falling into the atmosphere. 
uh, maybe it could have led to disruption of the Oort cloud of comets that uh, cometary bodies that we think are out there surrounding the solar system by the million and maybe that accounts for the dust and the bombardment and all of the effects and indeed the other effect of being in the spiral arm is that the spiral arms are where supernovae occur this is supernova 1987a from the large magellanic cloud so not quite in our galaxy it's in the dwarf galaxy next door but the point is that the star forming regions are where you get giant stars because giant stars don't live long enough to migrate anywhere else. They explode more or less where they were born within a 10 million years of their own creation. And so if the sun was wandering through the uh, reaches of a spiral arm where lots of star forming is going on and lots of giant stars are thereby exploding as supernovae, maybe that could account for the evidence of all the damage to the ozone layer and the ultraviolet radiation. And so maybe there's a whole series of bad events all caused by our position in the galaxy. Of course, when you get supernovae, you get stellar mass black holes. And so wandering through the spiral arms, there are probably quite a few black holes and you really wouldn't want to go too near one of these. Um, obviously we didn't fall into one but uh, perhaps the gravity of these things is enough to disturb the uh, Oort cloud and send a bombardment of uh, uh, large planetesimals our way and comets to smash into the earth. Anyway so uh, life did survive the t great dying and things got moving again quite quickly. It's amazing how fast, within a million years or so, life manages to uh, bounce back from all of these catastrophes. So the 251 to 199 million year ago period is the Triassic. And of course, this is very famous because it's the first of the ages of the dinosaurs. So they ended around about 200 million years ago and some of these dates uh, you look in different sources you get slightly different dates for them um, and here's a crater it's one of the largest on earth it's the uh, Manikuagan and uh, 214 million years is the date that's given but it's just before the Triassic gave way to the Jurassic but this crater has some friends the Obolon crater in the Ukraine, uh, there's one in France, there's one in North Dakota, several smaller ones that I didn't list here, all of which seem to impact the earth around about 214 to 200 million years ago. So again, maybe the earth's uh, climate was suffering the effect of multiple impacts throwing dust up into the sky again. Uh, this one's less certain than some of the others. So after the Triassic comes the Jurassic from that 201-ish million year period to 145 million, ruled by the dinosaurs here, the Stegosaurus and other familiar um, raptors and so forth, and inc including the first bird there, Archaeopteryx. Um, and you know what I'm going to say next, we have three smoking gun craters, here's G Goss's buff crater in Australia from 145 million years ago and there are two others one in the Barents Sea and uh, another one in South Africa that they're both buried beneath either sediments or water so we can't see them from a photographic point of view but they're very large craters and they are L crondites so it looks like this was more of the flora family of uh, asteroids having another go at the Earth around about 145 million years ago, perhaps uh, a shower of three or more large asteroids smashed into the Earth and uh, changed the uh, environment again, kicking the uh, end of the Jurassic period and seeing us into the Cretaceous. Now the Cretaceous period here looks a bit familiar with the vague outlines of some of the continents you might recognize, but things a little different. High sea levels, 
very warm, 30% oxygen in the air, so more than the 20% that we have now. And uh, this age was, of course, the third age of the dinosaurs, and they came to a sticky end 65, 66, depending on sources, million years ago, when something very, very bad happened again. We had creatures like uh, the pliosaur, some people think this is the Loch Ness monster, and the familiar ammonites in the sea on the land. We got the T Rex and the Triceratops there. But after a nice run of 80 million years, suddenly it all uh, went bad for them. In fact, here's a little chart showing that the survivors, which were the insects, the mollusks, the mammals, the turtles, lizards and snakes, crocodiles and fish, whereas all of the dinosaur species listed down the bottom there, except for the birds, which are the descendants of the uh, bird-hipped theropod dinosaurs. The birds were the survivors, and perhaps this was because they were mobile. And this was, as you uh, I'm sure are aware, another impact event. We had uh, a huge impact 65 million years ago in the Yucatan Peninsula of uh, uh, Mexico and uh, Alvarez discovered a layer of iridium that goes right around the world. There he is with his hands holding a piece of it and you can see the dark layer there and you can even see it in the hills in the background uh, on the boundary between the Cretaceous and the Paleocene rocks um, going across here. It's very very noticeable and this was iridium and melted glass fragments from the huge impact. Uh, a lot of soot as well and that was probably because of forest fires. And so uh, this was the crater of doom for T-Rex and there's a radar image of the uh, gravity anomaly just off the peninsula there. But it's not the only one to date from this era. The Baltish crater in Ukraine, there's the Silver Pit crater in the North Sea and the Shiva crater just off India all date to this same period around 66 million years ago. So again, maybe the Chicxulub crater was a big one, but it probably was part of another shower of space rocks coming in. Here's a, a, a diagram of the underwater Shiva crater. This is 300 miles wide, so it's absolutely massive. It's bigger than the Chicxulub uh, crater, in fact. And just next to it, over on the continent of India, around 66 million years ago and for nearly a million years was one of these enormous flood basalt events covering uh, nearly half the continent of India there and so the climate was going to be badly affected by uh, all of the output of the volcanoes uh, with ruining the climate, the acid rain, temperatures going first cold because of the blocking out of the sun and then hot because of all of the carbon dioxide that was released. And so we could ask ourselves which of these events was the one that caused all of this. Uh, very popular to say it was the Chicxulub. Perhaps uh, some say it was the lava eruption on its own and the impact craters had nothing to do with it. I prefer to think that actually oh, they're all related and that a shower of uh, asteroids came in, made a series of craters across the earth and crashed into India and punched through and released all of that flood basalt as well, just like we see on the moon. I mean, there's no reason why not. Now we're getting up to, uh, almost up to the present day, there's yet further indications of craters Here's another one, the Popigai crater in Siberia, 62 miles across. And this 35 million years lines up with the Eocene, Oligocene extinction event where uh, another large slice of uh, the uh, life got wiped out. Not perhaps as famous as the uh, end of the dinosaurs. And then, 15 million years ago, another couple of craters here, 
that came in and hit the Earth. And uh, this was undoubtedly a binary asteroid that created these two craters in Germany. And again, this possibly did the uh, climate no good around 15 million years ago in the Miocene period. So again, this all creates this punctuated existence for life where it uh, takes over every nook and cranny of the ecosystem and then gets an enormous setback, which allows it to then re-radiate in different forms. So that brings us more or less up to date. What's going to happen next? Well, we've got the asteroid Apophis, which is uh, 370 meters long, weighing 60 million tons to worry about. In 2029, it's going to do a close pass of the Earth between the Earth and our geostationary satellites. That's a very near miss. And of course, the gravity of the Earth will change its orbit significantly. Believe you with me, we're going to track it very carefully as it leaves to see where it goes, because it's coming back in 2036. And depending on that, exactly how much of a gravitational nudge it gets from the Earth and the Moon as it flies past us, it will uh, hopefully miss us, but there is a possibility that it'll land somewhere along that dotted red line. Um, it doesn't really matter where it lands, it's uh, very bad for everybody. This is its orbit, as you can see, not only does it cross the orbit of the Earth, it also does a flyby of Venus. And again, that can give it a nudge, which uh, can make the uh, orbit uh, rather difficult to predict. I vote it hits Venus rather than the Earth. Who, who agrees with me? That would be better, wouldn't it? But when we look at all of these mass extinctions and we try to make sense of them, uh, David Raup in 1984, along with his uh, collaborator Jack Sapowski, published a paper claiming that there was a pattern here. And if you look at it, I can see why. Those spikes in the disappearance of uh, millions of species of life do seem to have a certain regularity to them. Now this is looking just at the last uh, 542 million years since the Cambrian, so we're looking at the fossil record of complex creatures just uh, for that. And the periodicity seems to be about every 27 million years. Um, and yeah, the last one was about 27 million years ago, perhaps. So uh, maybe we're in trouble. And one explanation that was possibly floated for this was that perhaps the sun has an unseen companion. A lot of stars are binary stars. So maybe there's a large object, a, a small star or a failed star brown dwarf companion orbiting around on a very long time scale. And maybe that comes in towards the uh, solar system, towards the inner part of the solar system and perturbs uh, either the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt or something and causes a storm of uh, impacts to occur on all of the planets. And the, the idea being that at the moment perhaps uh, Nemesis might be a very long way away uh, as the two orbit round their common centre of mass and it could be as much as half the distance between ourselves and the Proxima Centauri, the Alpha Centauri nearest star system, where we might find this. Now we've been and looked for it, and they've managed to rule out uh, the possibility of it being a red dwarf star because the WISE infrared survey has covered the whole sky and not found anything, and a, a red dwarf star that close would have stuck out like a sore thumb. It's also tracked down a lot of brown dwarfs and found quite a few of them. There's one of the discovery images out at 6.6 .6 light years. So it would probably have found anything if it was there. So I think we might rule out the idea of Nemesis. Of course, there's one small, rather nasty possibility, which is that it's a uh, small black hole and we would not have spotted it by these sorts of techniques. Um, a baseball sized black hole or larger that had a significant mass is a perfectly reasonable possibility. But there's no evidence for it really either. Another idea that explains the 27 million year 
period in the uh, mass extinctions is that the sun wanders up and down through the galactic plane as it uh, orbits around the sun and maybe that is the cause of a series of bombardment events a bit like we were saying about being inside a spiral arm but the long-term risk to the uh, earth really is our sun it's what keeps us alive but the total thermal output from it is gradually increasing as it evolves and it uh, converts more and more of the hydrogen to helium in the core it has to hydrostatically readjust and that causes it to swell up a bit and the larger surface area means the total heat output increases as the radius goes up even though the temperature is staying more or less the same for the moment and so gradually the amount of heat that the earth is going to receive is going to increase and we live nicely within the middle to inner part of the habitable zone at the moment where it's not too hot not too cold but just right but that habitable zone is going to move outwards as the sun ages mars is too cold at the moment um, we'll get warmed up next uh, but the earth may get fried um, and then gradually as the uh, sun continues to swell into its red giant phase the earth will get toasted and even mars will become too hot and the habitable zone will be out in the outer planets so maybe some of the moons of the outer planets will be the place to go if they're still around in uh, five billion years time now there are other unpredictable events recently we had this uh, Oumuamua, an interstellar visitor from deep space, just came shooting through the solar system. And uh, so not correlated to anything that we'd been observing or tracking. This great space rock flew past the Earth and disappeared out into deep space, never to be seen again. Um, now it was small enough that uh, it didn't cause any pertur perturbation of anything else. And it didn't hit anything. And certainly it would have not been good if it had hit the Earth. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, it didn't really cause any perturbation of the changes in the orbits of the asteroids or anything. But we also know that the galaxy is full of rogue planets that have been ejected from their solar systems. So there's a possibility that one of these might come our way. I seem to remember some 1960s sci-fi uh, stories about the same sort of idea of a rogue planet wandering through the solar system, and that certainly could. Uh, disrupt of the asteroid belt causing uh, another heavy bombardment or change the Earth's orbit even which would be very bad but uh, looking out into deep space the other threat that we've got to worry about are the supermassive black holes in the hearts of galaxies we see these as uh, quasars when they're feeding and they beam huge jets of very strong radiation out we get to see them from the far side of the universe and of course these were very active a long time ago when the galaxies were being formed but now they seem to have calmed down and so luckily there are no quasars in our immediate vicinity but there are supermassive black holes and they do uh, feed and produce jets this was the event horizon telescope picture of the supermassive black hole in the middle of M87 which is just 50 million light years away and we're slowly heading towards it at 2 million miles an hour and these things when they feed they can produce these enormous jets and uh, you wouldn't want to stand in the way of one of these jets of uh, energetic particles doing nine tenths the speed of light as it shot out along the magnetic axis of the spinning black hole um, it'd be a very bad thing and we think that our black hole in the middle of our galaxy most recently had a really good meal about six million years ago because we can see the output from it as x-ray and gamma ray emissions from these enormous bubbles that are above and below the galactic plane and so it's possible that our small furry ancestors might have witnessed the uh, intense radiation from the black hole uh, back then about six million years ago 
but fortunately we're not in the direct beam and we are 25,000 light years from it so it would have been spectacular but not dangerous and of course finally we have the fact that galaxies collide with each other from time to time and uh, we're going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy in about 5,000 million years and we probably won't find our star colliding with a star from Andromeda. In fact, no two stars are very likely to hit each other at all, so much space there is between them. But what it will do is stir up all of the gas and dust and trigger an enormous burst of new star formation. And new star formation goes hand in hand with lots of hot young giant stars being around and exploding as supernovae. So it will become a supernova rich environment. And again, that could be very bad from the point of view of life. So there you go, there's a whistle stop tour of the universe and all the possible ways that it's out to get us. And uh, well, there are probably more that I haven't even thought of in that uh, lecture. Thanks a lot.